word on this computer because I know people will. <clears throat> Okay, it's recording. We're going to start with prayers as we usually do. We're not going to do our um, Bible study on Matthew. We'll pick up with that, I, I guess, next Sunday. We never even talk next Sunday. It's New Year's Eve, but it's New Year's Eve morning, so we will still meet because nobody's partying New Better Year's Eve morning. Better the morning before than the morning after. That's right. <laughs> so um, we will meet next week, but um, I want to. we're going to do prayers, and I'll send it over to or have Scott start the prayer. But before we do that, I just wanted to do... Um, a little prelude to the prayer, if you will. Uh, you, you guys have been so kind to pray for our son, and you'd ask me how my visit went. Um, I have a wayward son who's on the street um, and is uh, a meth addict and is with a meth addict at this time, um, point in his life. And uh, it was his 30th birthday at the beginning of December, and the visit didn't go well. And, um, and since then, there's been some scary phone calls and things haven't gone well. And every morning I pray um, that, some, that God will put someone in his path um, for him that, that will um, show him the way with, that will reach him. And I pray that same thing every night. And um, this past week, it, it hit me. Um, and I'm sure many of you have heard the parable of um, the drowning man. And, you know, it's obviously not a parable from a, the Bible. It's a modern day parable. And it's about the man who is on top of, there's a big flood in the city and he's on top of the roof. And a um, rowboat comes by and says, you need to get, you know, you're, you're gonna drown, you, you need to get on this boat. And he says, it's okay, I believe in God and I'm praying to God, I'm fine. And next comes a, um, a um, a motorboat and the same thing he says get on the boat you're going to drown he says no i'm praying to, and you know i believe in god i have faith and um it'll be okay and next thing a helicopter comes down and brings down a rope and says to the man get hang on to the rope come on and he says i have faith in god and the waters rise he drowns he ends up in the pearly gates talking to god and he said god i had faith in you and i prayed and i prayed and i prayed and God says, and I answered your prayer. He says, you know, I brought a, a rowboat and a motorboat and a helicopter. And all of a sudden I told, came home the other day to Scott because this elderly man had called me on the phone saying that some guy was trying to stab our son and he, he got him to get away. And this old gentleman says, you know, I told him he needs to get away from this woman. He needs to change his life around. And all of a sudden I thought about the woman who called me on the street that brought him food, about my nanny's son who called me last week when I was in Tucson and, and, and about this old gentleman. And, and I thought, oh my gosh, God has not given up on him. He keeps trying to bring someone in his path. So sometimes when you think your prayers aren't being answered, they are. But you know what? As Scott always says, he didn't make us into sock puppets. So Peter has to say yes. And my prayer is that his heart gets unhardened. Sorry. But we have lots of prayers. We do. Uh, Kathy's not with us. We thought she might be. Alton um the the pain from the the bone cancer in his hip has gotten pretty extreme and she is so tired we we went over and took some food but she is so tired so remember kathy and alton and the same sort of a thing is going on with friend, phil and sheree our friends uh phil's is parkinson but he's dealing with parkinson's and she is so tired from taking care of him so please remember them um, my sister had her knee surgery and, uh, she's, she's in a lot of pain, but we got a lot of help from Julie Clumpian this week. <laughs> she was able to give some pointers and she's just slightly ahead of her on the, on the curve and she's, she's doing okay. I think Julie actually also helped us motivate her to get up and do the exercises and that's a big deal. So, uh, and then Anita Diebel, who's not with us also this morning, uh, we had prayed for her sister numerous times. She wasn't doing well. She she died this week. She passed away. And so, you know. And she's in San Antonio. Anita's in San Antonio. And the funeral or uh, the celebration of life is on Tuesday. Uh, 
Gene is not with us because his eldest sister, who has been in, in really bad shape, not really even communicative for quite a long time, they finally called and said, you need to, you need to get here. The, his two sisters, other sisters have been taken care of her. And so he's up to, to comfort them and to spend those last moments. Uh, and this all sound like, you know, no, we've got good news. Yes, we, we do. Actually do. Next to <laughs> uh, Kay is online, the one that, that has the beach house. As <laughs> she's going to be moving in. She has been trying to get this thing finished for a long, long time. And without going into painful details, you still have some things going on with the builder. Uh, and having been there in the past personally, I know how disruptive that is, you know, to try and get these things settled. But she gets to move in on Thursday. And we have to remember to say thanks. Uh, and then Cindy. Um, she had treatment on, on Friday and um, that went well, but she also met with a leukemia doctor who gave, which as she said at the beginning, if any of you know anybody with leukemia, she met the most amazing doctor ever. So keep that in mind for connections, but she also got new, good news from the leukemia doctor that it's, it's very few cells. And so it's very good news. And I think it was last week while we were in our Bible study, these elves materialized on the front of our car. And I'm told that Cindy knows who did it, but uh, <laughs> Cindy and Paula both do that and they send cards and it makes a big difference to everybody. So uh, God, we always, always try to remember to come thankful. We tend to forget the answered prayers. We tend to forget that you don't force upon us a change of heart, but you reach out to us. You give that opportunity to us often. And we tend to forget that the people who get sent into someone else's life are often us. We're thankful for the presence. We're thankful for the people that you do send to us. This time of year where we need to remember that you thought enough to send a Messiah, to send a son, to send a child, to make reconciliation with you possible. And we ask for the hearts to recognize that always. Amen. Amen. So um, today, uh, those of you who come regularly to our Bible study knows that one of our big premises is that the people in the Bible were real people and to, to, to make sure we understand that they were real people. I mean, I think as we study Matthew and we find out, you know, we learn about the disciple Peter, you know, everybody knows Peter um, talks first and thinks second, puts his foot in his mouth, he's bold, and, you know, getting to know these people as real people. Um, and when we think about the, the manger scene, I don't think there's anything in our religious background that is more not real people. I mean, you know, you think about, and you know, I love the nativity scenes. I have many of them up in our house. And so I love the nativity scene. But when you think about the nativity scene, talking about people that aren't real. Two-dimensional. They're two-dimensional. You've, you've got Mary Joseph, you've got the baby, you've got the three kings, and you've got the shepherds all at once. And if you know the story, it didn't happen like that. And anyhow, and they're not real people. And Scott and I thought a lot this week about you know, if if the timing is right, and if this is was Christmas Eve, what, what were what were Mary and Joseph doing? And so that's sort of the the premise and the the theme of of today. And um, if oh oh, sorry. So um, 
if um, we're going to start with Luke um, reading or not reading because you know it by heart, but Luke 2 and those you know, Scott's favorite gospel is the gospel of Luke and Luke is the gospel that tells the Christmas story in the most detail. And I normally read from the Berean, but this is poetry in the King James. And I keep, you know, I do know it, but I thought, how embarrassing would it be to get something wrong <laughs> reciting it? So I am going to read it. Uh, this is Luke 2, beginning at verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus. Uh, it, wow, that all the world should be taxed. I don't know what it cut off the edge of this. I'll have to memorize it. Um, and this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And it, uh, and it went out, that's weird, and it went out that, that uh, each person should be taxed in his own city. And Joseph was sent up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth to Judea uh, because his, he was from the line of David uh, to, the, to the town called Bethlehem uh, to be taxed with his espoused wife who was great with child. And so it was that when they were, when they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her, forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger uh, because there was no room for them in the inn. This is more disturbing than trying to do it from memory. It's like cut off the edge. This is really odd. All right. And, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Uh, and the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, we bring to you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Uh, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, uh, the shepherd said, let us go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has uh, made, made possible. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when it was, you want to read that on? After they had seen the child, they spread the message they had received about him. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. But Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, which was just as the angel had told them. So that's, that's Luke's account. Uh, Matthew actually has a, a much more, I don't know, succinct version of it. But it, it's... Uh, well, we'll get into some details on it. You want to go ahead? I think the, the first thing we want, we want to um, play one um, hymn, and it's called Breath of Heaven, and Amy Grant um, sang it. And this, as you think about Mary and what was Mary thinking about? We watched last night um, the Nativity Story, and if you've never seen that movie back from, I think it was 2003 or something, it is one of the best um recreations of the of the nativity story but there's a, a scene that you know both um the angel appeared to both mary and joseph and both of them the angel told them do not be afraid and you know we often talk about that whole idea of do not be afraid is something that is said over and over to us and and to the people of the bible and there's a scene in the nativity story where they're traveling from Nazareth to Bethlehem and Joseph and Mary are sitting there very tired on the way and they're eating and about to go to sleep one night on their on their journey and they said are you afraid and both of them said yeah I'm afraid and and the thought that you know the angel told them do not be afraid 
but that doesn't mean they weren't afraid. True. And um, okay, do you want to? Yeah, even if it, the thing is, even if it wasn't in December, <clears throat> there was a time that was the day before or the morning of when the child is going to be born. And so right now, as we gather, as we study this, Mary and Joseph would be on the road. And it's a, it's a hard road between the two. I mean, we've seen it, you know, we live there. And, and there's, there's a, a path in between the two, but it's rocky, ugly country. Uh, and she's nine months plus pregnant. And they're, as we sit here, they're out on the road somewhere. Those of you who watch this um, in the recording, we may well have to edit it out. It comes from the nativity, and and they may they may black mark me if I if I try and run it, but we'll try. Um, oh, share screen. Yeah. And share sound. Share sound, so everyone at home can hear. We felt like there should be a hymn. Bro. Really? 
My turn. <laughs> so <clears throat> over the last couple of weeks, I have heard uh, just a lot of comments from people saying, I don't feel the Christmas spirit at all anymore. And, uh, you know, some, I, I just want it to be over with. I'm tired of all of this. And I realize it's, it, you know, uh, things have changed, certainly in our culture. And I confess this, it was yesterday, Mary had to go to Corpus to do client meeting on a Saturday. And I had to go out and do errands. And then I called her and said that I had stopped and bought a railroad spike. Because if I say anything about wanting to go back into HEB or Walmart, I want her to drive it into my skull. Uh, it's just, it is not what we grew up thinking of as the Christmas spirit. And I realized just how, I mean, just how wrong that is. Uh, but I want to talk a little, because we've had this, this thing that got sort of invented over the years uh, and we go out looking for that Christmas spirit to come find us. And, and it, it is by and large, you know, mythology that's been built up. I made a joke at the Christmas party as we had been listening to Christmas carols on Roku. And one of the lines stood out to me that let's give thanks to the Lord above because Santa Claus comes tonight. <laughs> and it just makes my head want to explode. I think, do you not, am I the only one that understands there's something a little <laughs> twisted about that? But I want to talk a little bit about the world that Jesus was born into. And I don't normally want to do just history, but it's important to understand what's going on uh, here with this. And we mentioned Mary and Joseph being on the road at this time, but Mary and Joseph get betrothed. And the way it works is it's essentially a marriage, but they can't have any contact with each other for a year. And it's no accident. I mean, we're all grown ups. That's to be sure that she is pure when the marriage is finally consummated. You understand that's the intent. And she runs off to stay with her, her cousin, Elizabeth, who has given birth to who we now know as John the Baptizer. And she, they're betrothed. And she comes back clearly pregnant. And it's more than a scandal. Uh, if Joseph says, that's my baby, if he claims the child, then the people of the village of Nazareth are going to say, well, then you guys, she, the baby was conceived before she went off. That's why she left. It's a terrible thing. And he's got to bear the, the shame of that as well. Or he, they, he can say, it's not my baby. And this happened while she was off uh, visiting Elizabeth, in which case, it, and we're told, I mean, it is very possible for them to stone her and kill her for doing it. I mean, this is a, this is a big deal. Uh, Mary gets told, don't be afraid. And Mary says, well, you know, let it be unto me as you, as you said. But Joseph, his first inclination, I mean, he's a righteous man. He's a good guy. And he says, look, I'm not going to claim the child, but I'll divorce her quietly. And I won't bring any charges. And the way this thing works is, in order for someone to be tried, there has to be an accuser. In Jewish law, the witness is very, very important. And he says, if I'm not a witness, she can't be stoned. Uh, this is, you know, it's serious stuff. And then he gets a visitation from an angel who says, you know, don't be afraid. Uh, excuse me, don't be afraid. It's all on the up and up. Uh, the baby is conceived by the Holy Spirit. But his first inclination was to say no. You know, does, does Joseph need to be forgiven for that? I don't think so. You know, this, we, we often are faced with these, these things. So the first reality is the two of them and the position that they're in. And they're being sent back because he's from Bethlehem, which is the city of David. He's got to go register for the census for taxation in Bethlehem. Well, there are prophecies that say that he comes from the house of David and probably this census is the only way that could happen. 
It, it hits the prophecy, just like later on, it says that you know, his son will be raised up out of Egypt. And there are people that said, what do you mean? He comes from the city of David and he comes from Egypt, but we know that they run off to Egypt for a while. So uh, there's the, you know, there's the first reality of this. This is, you know, Mary and Joseph are in this lousy position. And if you want to talk about Christmas spirit, She's about to, she could deliver the baby on the road. I mean, this is just that close. And they come up into this, you know, into this town and it says there's no room at the inn. There's not likely that there's anything that we would call an inn. That's English translation. But people open up their houses and, and this is family coming back to where their family is from. We don't know if Joseph's family was gone, but they get to this, this, place and they're and they're desperate this is not christmas spirit go to heb and walmart and see the way people are acting well if they didn't know any better which they do at this point but even knowing better this is not this is not lights and and tinsel and and songs ringing out right it's a difficult time and we have these shepherds that they undoubtedly would have passed on the way to bethlehem well, shepherds are like almost the lowest of the low. They spend most of their entire life isolated. They get stuck out there in the fields. And so I talked to Mendigo about the witness in Jewish law. And in order for anything to be believed in their court, you have to have at least two witnesses. And if you only have one, it doesn't matter. I always try and give you the example that if, if, uh, if two people go into a house, one of them walks out covered in blood and the other one is inside stabbed to death, there's no witness. You can't, I mean, everybody may know, but in court, you have to have two witnesses. Well, not just everybody can be a witness. And there are people like gamblers and habitual drunkards, trappers of doves, which we'll get to. Also, shepherds. Shepherds are not allowed to be witnesses because they're the lowest of the low. They're not considered reliable. So here they are, and they get this visitation. And it's kind of amazing when you think about it. If, if you were going to do something big, you'd contact the governor and the, and the, the mayor and a few other you know, dignitaries. You would not contact the lowest of the low. And to their, their credit, and what's the first thing they get told, by the way? Do not Don't be afraid. afraid. Fear not. But at this moment that we sit here, the morning of the night when the child was born, those guys are sitting out in a rocky, you know, field with a little bit of grass watching sheep. They have no idea. They're sitting out alone with a bunch of sheep, maybe another shepherd over here and another one over there. That's what's going on as we speak. They have no idea that they're part of a bigger plan and a significant part. Uh, and so the Christmas spirit has not reached them, what we think of. There's no, there's no, you know, songs and there's not stuff going on in the mall. Those guys are sitting out in a field and they come and it says, you know, to their credit, they go, well, we should probably go into town and see this thing that we've been told about, which a lot of people would not. These are simple people and they do what's needed. And then afterwards, it says that they go and tell everybody, but who cares? They're shepherds. They're not, they're not reliable witnesses even. You can have half dozen of them. All you need is two. Well, who's going to listen to a bunch of shepherds? Why would that happen that way? Why would you choose these people? And uh, we talked about in Matthew in that study on the Beatitudes, blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are, I mean, you go through all of this and what the message is, is the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and you're part of it. These shepherds never had been, never would have been. Uh, we have the story of wise men who come. And unfortunately, in our mythology, 
they show up, and I use that, I don't take that the wrong way. This is something that has been invented unnecessarily. The truth is pretty astounding, all right? But we have these scenes with these three kings who show up on the night of his birth. Well, A, they just didn't. B, they aren't kings. So we study the book of Daniel. Long, long time before this, the Jews get hauled off into captivity in Babylon. Daniel's one of them. Daniel winds up interpreting a dream for the king. Remember, he's in prison. He interprets a dream, and, and he becomes this advisor to the king. But he also gets put in with a group of people known as the Magi. And if that sounds like the root of the word magic, it is. And they're this group, I don't want to say shadowy, they are kings, they are king makers, they are advisors, they study all of the greatest wisdom of the world, the known world at that time, they bring in stuff from all over the place, Daniel eventually becomes the leader of the Magi, <clears throat> but they're behind, they're behind some of the biggest kings for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And, and if you're a king, you want one of these guys advising you or two or three of them because they know this stuff. And if they don't know it, they know how to go find out because they go ask some of the other magi. And it's, I believe, a lot of people believe that this knowledge that these magi have comes from Daniel. That was hundreds of years before. Hundreds of years before. And we talk about some of the prophecies of Daniel being some of the most uncanny. Sometimes prophecy, I read it and go, I, I don't even know if I see that. But Daniels are so uncanny. They are so precise about the rise of the, the Greek Empire and Alexander and the Romans. And this. I mean, it is amazing stuff. But I believe that Daniel probably tells them. And so they've been looking for this all this time. They're not kings. <clears throat> We're told they come with gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Well, we know gold. Frankincense is a, is a what am I, the sticks, incense. incense. It's a, it is an incense. It's a thing that's burned in religious. It's very expensive. And then myrrh they use to anoint dead bodies. But it's very, rich people can afford myrrh. Poor people can't afford murder. Their bodies can't be treated, okay? So they come with these expensive gifts from up somewhere probably around Iraq, modern-day Iraq. But in that time, you don't travel out through the wastelands, three guys with this expensive stuff. You just don't. Somebody's going to take it from you. That's why there are caravans. So these guys are, are wealthy, and they have access to wealth, they're not stupid. So undoubtedly, it's a whole lot more than three guys on camels with the most expensive stuff available. They probably have a, a train. At this time, all that time ago, the morning of the night of, they may well be setting out from Iraq as we speak. They have seen the signs that they've been, it's one of a lot of things that they've been looking for, and they go, wow, this is really happening. We've been waiting for this, but they're not alone, and they have people who are going to have to guard them and water the camels and be their servants. I mean, these are the rich guys. There are a whole bunch of, this is not Christmas spirit. You understand? They're going to have to tend, these other guys are going to have to tend camels, but even the ones who are traveling, they're going to have to head out across this a lot of really inhospitable country for a good while before they get where they're going, but they have the confidence of the, the prophecy of the promise, just like Mary and Joseph have the confidence of the promise they've received, just like the shepherds have the confidence that they bothered to leave sheep and come into town, you see, but this is not songs in a mall. None of them are, if you're waiting for the Christmas spirit to reach out and find you, you won't. Herod, on the other hand, right? We know about Herod. The guy that's Herod when Jesus is born is a king. There's another Herod later on when he's crucified, and I'll get to that moment just briefly. But this Herod is known as Herod the Great. Herod the Great builds 
amazing things in Israel. The second temple, he enlarges the temple. He makes it grandiose. I mean, he and he's known for just, but, but he taxes the people horrifically in order to do it. I mean, he, he, you know, he beats them down. But the deal with Herod is that he's loyal to Rome. He has been a, a, a servant to Rome. He rescued one of the Caesars in a battle one time. He swoops in with a bunch of his soldiers, pulls that Caesar out of a battle, and, and they trust him. So he is king of this whole area, but that only lasts so long as the money flows and you keep the peace. And as long as you do that, he's allowed to not just overtax. I mean, he's brutal. A lot of people also know that, what time is it? Am I in trouble? No, I can get through this. A lot of people also know that Herod is a Jew. And they say, why would a Jew be so mean to his own people? Why would he do that? And he is mean to them. I mean, he's horrible to them. Herod, Herod trusts power to begin with. Herod has already killed two sons and one wife, okay, uh, because he's worried about anything that threatens his rule. <clears throat> But a long time ago, you guys all know Jacob and Esau. We did a, a series on them, right? Jacob and Esau and the birthright and everything, okay, right? Esau is this big red-haired hunter that's dad's favorite. Jacob is not. He's mom's favorite, and he kind of stays at home. But the red hair, they're told they're twins. Remember, Jacob and Esau are twins, and they're both going to be the fathers of great nations. Well, Esau is the father of a great nation. They're known as Edomites, right? They, they always have trouble with the Edomites. Well, there's a point where Israel goes and captures the Edomites and forces them to convert to Judaism at sword point. You either convert or we're going to kill you. Maybe some of you can run away, but you're not staying here. And, and, and not be a Jew. So they wind up being circumcised. They wind up taking it. Herod's not a Jew. Herod's an Edomite. And, and he's not happy that his people were, were forced to convert at sword point. So he's, he, he, he plays the Jewish game because it helps to keep the people, you know, in check. But he hates them. He hates them. Deep down, there's, this has been done to his people, and this is, my, you know, this is my chance for revenge. And so here we have Herod, who is obsessed with power and is not real fond of Jews anyway, and he hears that there's a new king of the Jews, which, by the way, he is the king of the Jews because Rome says so. He travels off, at one point he travels off to Rome, and while he's there, the Senate says, you know, we like you. You're the new king of the Jews. We need this area. So he is the king of the Jews. Well, he's already killed two sons and a wife for being disloyal. And the idea of a new king of the Jews makes him a little bit crazy. And so there are people who will tell you, we don't have any proof that the massacre of the innocents ever really happened. Why would he record that to begin with? Why would he record that? He's got to play the game of being a king of the Jews, but we already know that he would kill his own sons and his own wife. There's a Roman leader who hears about what we know as the massacre of the innocents and actually writes to a, a, you know, a friend, it's better to be Herod's pig than Herod's son. So why would we think that he wouldn't do something like that? And so we, we have this, undercurrent that we don't even know about as of this morning of Herod's getting antsy out there. And soon after that, these magi arrived and they said, yeah, we come here looking for this babe or this new king of the Jews. And Herod is just nuts over it. So I'm going to stop it no matter what. And again, if anybody ever tells you we have no evidence that it ever happened, we have more evidence that it's likely to have happened by far. I'll throw in one little bonus coverage. When Rome comes in, the area up around the Galilee, they want to fight. Everybody wants to fight the Romans, right? Well, they have a leader up there in that Galilee area, and he says, no, Rome's too powerful. We're not going to fight them. And he just surrenders to 
to the Romans. He surrenders all of his people to the Romans because he's a politician and he's expedient. And his name is Josephus, and Josephus becomes a pet of the Romans, and he becomes their historian. He becomes the guy who writes about all the stuff that's going on, and if anything's going to be recorded, chances are Josephus is the one recording it, and he's so loyal to the Romans, Josephus isn't going to record that somebody went out and had all these, he's just not going to do it. Now, I've told you lots of times that Rome cares about two things. They care about having money flow, and they care about keeping the peace, because when there's no peace, the money doesn't flow. So they let these Jews sort of govern themselves. And as long as they keep the peace and the money flows, they're okay. They get to be powerful. But I'll get to this. This is probably the last bit of this. Maybe it is. But I've talked recently as we study Matthew, the people who are running the religious life, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, you all know about them, right? They don't believe any of this stuff. The Sadducees, who we're going to get to next week, are the priests. By and large, they're the priests. They're the ones who are, who are in charge. They don't even believe there's an afterlife. They don't believe there's a heaven. They don't believe in any of this stuff. And they say so. This is not people after the fact making it up. It's in their writings. All they want to do is keep people kind of suppressed so that Rome doesn't take away their ability to run things. They get to be the, the, you know, the king of the hill under the Romans so long as they keep the peace. So now we have all of these religious people running the, the, the I don't want to call it the church, but running Judaism. They don't even believe any of this stuff. Why would you go to them? You would think, well, why would he go to shepherds and why would he go to people from over? Because the people who are running things now are the opposite of that. And you're going to see that play out as he goes, as we're hitting in Matthew, as he goes uh, for the, for, to sacrifice himself. <clears throat> we're gonna, that's what you're actually seeing. You're seeing people who don't want a Messiah, literally do not want, because we don't need the Romans to be overthrown, because right now we've got their power to fall back on if we get in trouble, and then we get to be the, the king of the hill. They don't want a Messiah. They don't want him to show up. That's the world he's born into. That's not Christmas spirit. That's not joy to the world the Lord has come. There are people who are prepared to hear this, but mostly the people who, the important people who are running the show, none of them want this. They all have reasons for not wanting it. And so we've come, you know, to have this idea that there is this Christmas spirit of, uh, you know, brotherhood and joy. And strangely, there is. But it's us. We're put here for that reason. And you say, well, uh, there's no way that the Pharisees, the Sadducees, Herod, uh, the Romans, or anybody else, why would they change? They got all the power, they've got all the money, they got everything that they, that they you know, I mean, why would they? The only, and the only way, we're going to play a hymn in a minute, it's O Come Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. What are they captive to? Well, it's not just the Romans. There's going to be no change until there's a change of heart. And that's us. That's what we're here for. And too many of us have wound up the American mythology that took this over that said, you've got to buy a whole lot of gifts. I mean, we have commercials on TV now that say, if you really love your spouse, you'll buy them a BMW. Nothing, <laughs> nothing says I love you like a BMW. And then people wind up in financial trouble and fighting with each other and everything else that goes on. It's, is it any wonder that when you go to HEB, people are all angry? It's our job to take a Christmas spirit to them. It's, it's our place. And what we've been seeing from Matthew over and over, week after week, is that this message is the kingdom of heaven is at hand and you're a part of it. 
And I look out, I look on the screen, I look at you, make no mistake, you wouldn't have been part of it. You wouldn't have been. Maybe somebody in among you is some really great politician type, you know, I don't know of any of you who are. But if you weren't, if you weren't able to rise up in the ranks of the Sadducees or the Pharisees or anything else, if you weren't able to play Rome to your advantage, you would not be a part. You would not. There would be no, you know, they, they aren't celebrating. They aren't, they aren't in New York at the big ice skating rink. I want you to remember those images we have from when we're kids and everybody's at the big ice skating rink. Remember, everybody is out in their Christmas best. The gifts, the gifts are stashed over on the side of the rink because nobody's going to steal them. And they're ice skating, right? There are people working at the ice skating rink. There are people working at Macy's. There are people who, you know, serve the meals, whatever. This is a myth. And if you're waiting for the myth to come and find you, it won't. We allowed ourselves to believe that, that you know, the gifts are, are there because we celebrate the gift that God gave to us. How many of you really did that very often? <laughs> now, you may have on Christmas Day, when you're at the, our Christmas Eve service or midnight mass, you may have thought about it momentarily. The rest of the time, you're just out in a fever pitch trying to get more, gather more stuff because <laughs> nothing says I love you like a BMW. <laughs> There's a commercial that says, you want a better life at the best price, you deserve it at cons. <laughs> This, this is what we've done. This is what it's become. And you look at these, and as Mary said, these are real people. You, you, have, you have people who have the joy of the promise that they've been given, right? It's, it's, not, it's not the other things that we look for. And I want to read one last thing because I talk about this fairly often, even though it's not part of the Christmas story. We were, a lot of us told growing up, well, you know, the Jews killed Jesus or the Romans killed Jesus. And I keep telling you, no, they didn't. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. Right? And I don't make this stuff up. It's just sometimes it's not where we're studying. But I want to read one last thing out of John. He came here for a reason. And the plan the whole time was, was not a manger scene. And so I'm going to read, this is from, this is from a John 10, and it starts at verse 14, and it says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Nobody takes it, and we're going to get, we're going to, get to that. That's why he came. That's, what's going to, that's what this whole purpose was. He says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them in as well, and they will listen to my voice. Who is that? That's us. They had written their own mythology that said only the Jews are going to be part of this. Only, only good Jews, and not even all the Jews, not the shepherds, not the other people. And he says, there, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. And he's talking to Jews, and I'm bringing them in. That's us. He says, and then there will be one, shot, one flock and one shepherd. He says, the reason the Father loves me is that I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This charge I've received from my Father. So it seems a little odd to be talking about the lead up to Easter at Christmas. I think that, that if we are out looking for the Christmas spirit to come find us, We've lost that. And, and there is, in fact, a time to rejoice. And there is a spirit that goes along with it. And we're here to actually bring that to other people. When you go to Walmart and you want a railroad spike driven through your skull, it's our job. We're the ones who take the Christmas spirit. Do you want to play Emmanuel and then do prayers or do prayers and then Emmanuel? I'll, I'll do a prayer quick. We'll, we'll have that last prayer and you can you know, kind of listen for the words I said. God, we, we often ignore the comfort that you bring us. We often ignore the promise and we go out looking for promises from people 
that they can't even keep. We forget that the purpose in this was to bring people to your kingdom that had been excluded, people like us. I forgot earlier to say part of the prayers for our daughter, Julie, who's not doing well. And we'd ask your hand on her as well. But on, on each of us, there are so many of us that, that have felt this change around this Christmas time that we celebrate. And we forget the joy that's available. We lose sight of the message that brings joy to us when we see it. If I ask one thing this week, it's that you remind us, that you show us that and show us that we're part of bringing that to other people. Amen. And I'll see if I can get this last hymn going. This is my personal favorite. That's why we're playing it, not because <laughs> of anything else, but because it's my personal favorite. Um, Where is the thing that says um, I share screen? Screen. Zoom. Oh, come, oh, come, Amen. Yeah. 
you guys all have a very nice Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. And like I said, we will um, we'll send out something, but we will do next Sunday. Yes. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Christmas. It's good to see you. Merry Christmas, y'all. Bye-bye. Merry Christmas. <laughs> have ho, ho. <laughs> hey, Mary, if you were going to connect um, me with Scott's sister by text, y'all forgot to. I don't think I, I have. I need to do that. I will. Okay. Thank okay. you. I'll have to talk to her. Okay. Bye. Yes. 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 Yes.